In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, you call us to self-denial and to give our life for others. May the example of our Lord Jesus Christ inspire us in our discipleship. May our self-giving and magnanimity to others lead us all to bear fruit for your kingdom. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our catechesis today, I wish that we reflect on our Lord's remarks that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth, and it dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John chapter 12, verse 24. Our Lord Jesus Christ uses the metaphor of the grain of wheat to predict his own suffering, death, and resurrection. At the same time, this metaphor accentuates the necessity of sacrifice that his sacrificial death is about to endure will bring about salvation to the whole world. He goes further to say that the one who loves his life will lose it. But the one who has his life will keep it. In so saying, Jesus is underscoring the fact that greatness is best shown in humility, in sacrifice and sins. Thus, the shame on the cross ought to be seen as our glory and our weakness as God's strength. This is a grand reversal of our value systems, and that was the way of our Lord and an example for the disciples. In this divine paradox, the seed must die if it is to bear fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, but those who hate their life will keep it. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is human to be self-interested and to have unbridled ego. However, it is divine to see life in terms of humility, in terms of service, and in terms of sacrifice. And this is what Jesus enunciates Accordingly, there can be no glory without suffering. There can be no fruitful life without death. There can be no victory without surrender. The seed of grain is weak and inept on its own. But when it is planted, it dies and becomes fruitful. In other words, life comes only out of death. This principle is true of nature, but it is also true spiritually and eternally true in Jesus Christ. My dear and sisters in Christ, the context of our passage of reflection is at the backdrop of the Passover feast. Jesus Christ has just come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast once again, but now for the last time. Confer John chapter 12, verse 12. As was the case on his first trip, 
He comes from an intimate gathering among friends to an urban setting in the midst of crowds. Jesus had just visited the home of his friend Lazarus and his sisters at Bethany on his way to Jerusalem. It was on this occasion that he raised Lazarus from the dead. Confer John chapter 12 verse 17. And this event marked the turning point in Jesus' conflict with the Jewish authorities. The crowd had seen that even death was no match for Jesus and they were moved to belief. They saw amazing things and they believed in him. When Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, he attracted further crowds and caused the leaders in Jerusalem to be afraid of Roman retribution. Confer John chapter 11, verses 47 to 53. The Pharisees remarked with annoyance, Look, the whole world has gone to him. John chapter 12 verse 19. And after this, the Pharisees met and planned to kill Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus entered into Jerusalem with a lot of pomp, with cause of Hosanna from Psalms chapter 118. And the reenactment of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, marking the king's arrival to the holy city of Jerusalem. Indeed, Jesus' mission was an ingathering of the world, but its culmination will come through his death and resurrection. Reminiscing on Isaiah, the prophecy describes the arrival of foreigners, Israelites in the diaspora, and eunuchs to worship at the holy mountain. Further, the Lord promises, I'll bring them into my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, says the Lord. Isaiah chapter 56, verses 3 to 8. Immediately, some Greeks came who wished to see Jesus, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to see and to hear are the ways people come to know Jesus, to believe or trust in him. That is to recognize his unity and the singleness of purpose with the Father. Jesus said to Andrew, Come and see. And to Philip he said, Follow me. And St. Paul says, faith comes from healing. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. The Greeks wanted to see Jesus. Maybe Greek-speaking Jews of the diaspora or Greek proselytes to Judaism. Either way, they represent the breath of interest in Jesus. Greeks, as well as Galileans and Judeans, want to see, and by implication, want to believe. Jesus declared that the hour had come. In Greek, there are two ways for time, Kronos and Kairos. Chronos is the chronological time, the time that we measure on clocks and calendars. 
the time by which we keep appointments. However, Kairos is significant time, the decisive moment which makes all the difference in one's life. Thus, the hour refers to the moment when God who manifests his presence in Jesus Christ. And this presence is nowhere more evident than in Jesus' act of self-sacrificing love on the cross. For that is a reflection of God's love for all, the hour of the cross. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The Father glorified the Son in the incarnation. And in the prologue, it says, the Word became flesh and lived among us. We saw his glory, such glory as the one and the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Father also glorified the Son at the Transfiguration. John chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. The Father who glorified the Son again at the cross and the open tomb and at the day of his return. Confer Luke chapter 9, verse 26. But this glory entails death. Like the grain of wheat, which needs to fall into the ground and die in order to produce much fruit. Jesus indicated that only after the crucifixion could the gospel be available to both Jews and Gentiles. Jesus' words, I am troubled now, in this gospel could be John's allusion to the Gethsemane agony scenery narrated by the Snoptic Gospels. Lifted up. When the Son of Man is lifted up from the earth, he will draw all people to himself. That lifting up is simultaneously all the three events of crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. The title, The Son of Man, comes from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where the Ancient of Days gave to the one like a son of man dominion and glory and the kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Therefore, the title of the Son of Man does not have militaristic connotations associated with the title of Messiah. People expected the Messiah to raise an army to drive out the Romans to reestablish the great Davidic kingdom. They had no such expectations regarding the Son of Man. And Jesus' frequent use of the title in the connection with his passion suggests a veiled messianic title. The title obviously has meaning to Jesus, but the meaning will not be clear to the disciples until his resurrection. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us revert to our script for further reflections.
and we read, Now there were certain Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. These, therefore, came to Philip, who was from the side of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. And in turn, Andrew came with Philip, and they told Jesus. John chapter 12. Verses 20 to 22. These Greeks could be from Greece or the Decapolis, a group of ten cities near Galilee with large Greek populations. Given the Passover setting, it is likely that they are Jewish proselytes circumcised converts of the Jewish faith who are permitted to participate in Jewish festivals. Confer Exodus chapter 12, verses 45 and 48. Therefore, these came to Philip, who was from the side of Galilee. They are probably drawn to Philip because he has a Greek name, and from Bethsaida, near the Decapolis. They asked him, saying, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Jesus had become quite popular. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees were complaining that the whole world was following after him. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew came with Philip, and they told Jesus. The visit and the request of the Greeks illustrate the truth of the Pharisee's statement. Look, the whole world has gone after him. John chapter 12. Verse 19. At the same time, the visit of the Greeks prompts Jesus to acknowledge that his hour has come and becomes an occasion to announce that when he's lifted up, he will draw all people to himself. An obvious reference to all Gentiles. And Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. More certainly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it. He who has his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone saves me, let him follow me. Where I am, there will my servant also be. If anyone saves me, the Father will honor him. John chapter 12, verses 23 26. There are three area references in the Gospel of John to Jesus' hour. At Cana, Jesus said to his mother, My hour has not yet come. John chapter 2, verse 4. In Jerusalem, they sought therefore to take him but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Confer John chapter 7, verse 30. In the temple, no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. John chapter 8, verse 20. Yet, Jesus announces that his hour 
has finally come for him to be glorified. Glory is characteristic of God and refers to God's awe-inspiring majesty. God shared his glory with Jesus. He saw Jesus' glory revealed at the transfiguration and through his death and resurrection. He has given his glory to his disciples and has been glorified in them. And Jesus even prays, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. John chapter 17 Verse 24. And at the second coming, Jesus will return in a cloud with power and great glory. Confer Luke chapter 21, verse 27. Then, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Confer Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. Thus, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus introduces the divine paradox. The seed must die if it is to bear fruit, and those who love their life will lose it, but those who hate their life will keep it. John chapter 12. Verse 25. However, Jesus is not saying that happy people will lose their lives and depressed people will save their life. He is, as a matter of fact, saying that people whose lives are centered on self will lose them because the Father will not honor them. People whose lives are centered on service, even at the cost of sacrifice, will keep them. Because the Father will bless them with eternal life. Hence, the, the road to glory is service, servanthood. That was true for Jesus, and it is true for all would like to follow in his footsteps. Like Jesus, we are expected to be faithful even unto death and to trust that God will vindicate us. He says, if anyone saves me, let him follow me. To be Jesus' disciple is to follow him and to become a servant in the same measure he was. Where I am, there will be my servant also. Jesus' ultimate destiny is to return to the Father. So this constitutes Jesus' promise that his servant disciple will join him in that glorious city. However, the process by which Jesus will be glorified will begin with the cross. So Jesus is also saying that the servant disciple can expect to experience suffering along the way. If anyone says me, the Father will honor him. This is a third expression of the divine paradox honoring those that save. Jesus continues to say, Now 
my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this time, but for this cause I came to this time. Father, glorify your name. Then there came a voice out of the sky saying, I have both glorified it and I'll glorify it again. The multitude, therefore, who stood by heard it and say that it had thundered. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice hasn't come for my sake, but for your sake. John chapter 12. Verses 27 to 30. Jesus echoes Psalm chapter 42, verse 6, where the psalmist says, My soul is cast down within me. And Jesus makes a rhetorical question What should I say? Father, save me from this time. Jesus is contemplating what is coming before him. And in his humility, he says, I'm troubled, because his soul is in tough. However, Jesus answers his rhetorical question with a resounding no. And in addition, he says, but for this cause, I came to this time. It was for this very reason that he came to this hour to bring to completion his redemptive work. It is for this very reason that he was clothed in human garb, and for this very reason he was walking on the face of the earth. The reason of his incarnation is precisely for this moment. Thus, everything has been coming and leading up to this moment, the extremes that eventually merge into a river. Jesus walks this way as a fulfillment of his own mission. Instead of offering a prayer for his own safety or glorification, Jesus prays, Father, glorify your name. Then there comes a voice out of the sky. I have both glorified it and I'll glorify it again. The Father responds audibly to the Son's request, assuring the Son that he has glorified the Son and will do so again. The Father glorified the Son in the incarnation. The Word became flesh and lived among us. We saw his glory, such glory as of the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Father also glorified the Son at the transfiguration. John chapter 9, verse 28 to 36. The Father will glorify the Son again at the cross and the open tomb and the, at the day of his return. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the multitude, therefore, who stood by and they heard the voice from heaven said it had thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. The crowd does not know what to make of the voice. But Jesus responds, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. While the crowd does not understand the voice, they interpret it as an angel's voice or thunder. 
which in scripture is often associated with God's voice. Confer Exodus chapter 9, verses 23 to 33, chapter 19, verse 19, as well as 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10, Psalms chapter 18, verse 13. In other words, both thunder and an angel's voice are divine sounds. However, after the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, this voice will take on a new meaning. Often in our Christian world of life, we come to understand things in retrospection. When time has elapsed, that's when it becomes clear what we were going through. Some things become clear as we mature in faith and in our spirituality. Other things will only become clear when we come to see God face to face. Jesus further says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. But he said this, signifying what kind of death he should die. John chapter 12. Verses 31 to 33. The 2.40 now ties in with Jesus' announcement, the time has come. We think of God rendering judgment on the world at Jesus' second coming, but Jesus says that the judgment has already begun. In this verse, he speaks twice of this world. And we are reminded that he earlier said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and the only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 16. Now that the time has come, the time for his sacrifice on the cross. The presence of evil in our midst becomes more clear. The people of this world will be judged based on their decision to come or not to come to the light. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And the Greek word here means ruler and is used more for people in positions of authority both civil and religious rulers. Until now, John the Evangelist uses this word to refer to Jewish authorities who, with the exception of Nicodemus, were hostile to Jesus. Confer John chapter 3 verse 1, chapter 7 verse 26, as well as verse 48. At his glorification, Jesus who assumed power over the world. The last time that we heard the word, the Jews, meaning the Jewish leaders, were responding to the blind man who dared to answer their hostile interrogation by testifying of Jesus. They says, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Confer John chapter 9, verses 33. So they drove him out. John chapter 9, verse 34. But now Jesus says that it will be the ruler of this world, presumably including the religious rulers, who rejected Jesus will be cast out. And if I, I am lifted up from the earth, 
will draw all people to myself. John chapter 12, verse 32. This is the third time that Jesus speaks of being lifted up. Confer John chapter 3, verse 14. John chapter 8, verse 28. It is clear that he is speaking of the cross. Because in John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus draws a parallel between his being lifted up and Moses' lifting the serpent on a pole. For anyone who misses the point, John the evangelist appends the explanation that he said this, signifying by what kind of death he would die. John chapter 12, verse 33. However, in being lifted up, Jesus will also experience exhortation. His being lifted up on the cross will constitute an act of obedience to the Father's will in carrying out of the mission for which Jesus has come to the earth. By his death, Jesus would draw all people to himself. The phrase all people testifies to the fact that Jesus has opened the door to God's kingdom to all people. Whether that will be effective for a particular person depends on that person's response. While the rest of the world was able to see power only in its traditional forms like money, military might, political influence, manipulation of the innocent, Jesus saw power in the cross. History, my dear and sisters in Christ, has shown that Christ's vision was true and is true. His suffering and sacrifice have indeed drawn people to himself, people of every race, people of every nation, and people of every gender. The Jewish authorities who called for Jesus' death will soon see their temple leveled and their nation in the ruins. Rome, the personification of worldly power, would fall to barbarians soon enough. But Jesus, who chose the path of humility, the path of suffering, the path of servanthood, called into being a kingdom that has survived where everything else has fallen. Salient points for further reflections. Some Greeks came to Philip saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus probably because of the miracles he was performing. Philip told Andrew about the Greeks and their request. Philip and Andrew told Jesus, and Jesus said to them, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and it dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That was his response to those who wanted to see him. And this response applies to each and every one of us, you and me. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, surely we die in a thousand deaths throughout our lifetime. The loss of a loved one, the breaking up of a relationship, the loss of good health, the loss of opportunities, the shattering of our dreams, 
and all other deaths that we do endure. At times, we choose our losses and our death. We give up parts of ourselves for others. We change even our beliefs and values so that we can be more authentic and accommodative to others. Sometimes, there are things we need to let go in order to fully live such as fear, anger, resentment, regret, disappointment, that guilty feeling, that propensity always to be right, and the attitude of having the last word to every discussion, and the notion of seeking approval at all times. However, Seeing Jesus, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is not a spectator sport. It is a way of life, a way to be followed, a truth to be embodied, a life to be lived. It's being a grain of wheat that falls into the ground and it dies, so that it might bear much fruit. That's where we see Jesus. It's in the letting go, the empty, the living behind, and the dying that makes space for new life to arise. The question that begs an answer is, what is the grain of wheat in your life, in my life, that needs to fall into the earth and die. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not a mandate to become a martyr or a doormat, but to recognize that following Jesus requires that we give up our self-focused agendas and to step into our identity as children of God, and to experience the abundance of life. Death to self may vary from one to the other. For people pleasers, death to self is saying the truth and at times to say no. For the fearful, death to self means embracing faith and taking the risk. To the stingy, death to self means becoming generous with all that God has entrusted us with. To those who have been sitting on the sidelines, death to self means jumping into the middle and taking up the heat. For the introverted, it means going a little bit extroverted, and also vice versa. Death to self might also mean saying no, not always living to whatever anybody wants you to do. To some, death to self might be saying, I don't know, a surrender to pride. A surrender of the egoistic tendencies, the I know it always. I have to have my, my own way. To the adventurous, death to self might mean planting myself firmly in the soil of community and staying and being known. Going against some of the natural desires and the natural tendencies. Death to self is putting aside everything else and saying, God, what do you want from me? Not my will, but your will be done. Therefore, wanting to see Jesus, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, and especially in all his glory, in all his splendor, 
and in all his beauty, entails that we cannot look over the cross. That's where we see, that's where we ultimately and definitely see what Christ is like. Every other picture of God's glory is subsidiary. The glory of God is best displayed on the cross. That's where we see him most fully. Because the cross is wisdom. The cross is power. The cross is the glory of God. St. Paul ably and succinctly puts it, Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness. Confer Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Thus, he doesn't empty himself of God, but he empties himself of grasping and displayed what God is like. He characterized God. He displayed God. He glorified God, not by assuming power and suppressing others, but by emptying himself. Hence, the cross is not something God does, but the cross reveals who God is. The cross reveals what God is ultimately like. The cross shows us something extended to wrong. Love for enemies is put on display. Hope for the hurting is held out. Relationship with God is ultimately and finally restored. This is what God is like. Let us pray. God our Father, teach us to die to self, that we may you the harvest desirable for your kingdom. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.